Well, a very good uh, morning to you if you're calling in from uh, London or from Europe and a good afternoon in Asia or wherever you are, if you're watching this on, on a recording. Uh, and thank you ever so much for giving up your time uh, to join us on our webinar today entitled Vietnam's Digital Transformation. Very pleased to have a guest speaker today. I'll introduce him a bit later on. The webinar should last for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes, including Q&A. Uh, the webinar is recorded and copies will be made uh, available early next week. There'll be time for some Q&A at the end, as I've mentioned, and you'll be able to put questions into the Q&A tab and we'll try and address those uh, later in the presentation. I'm Craig Martin. I'm chairman of Dynam Capital. Dynam is a Guernsey regulated fund manager and we're the investment manager for Vietnam Holding. Vietnam Holding is listed on the main board of the London Stock Exchange. It's a closed end fund. Its market cap is about 108 million pounds sterling. Its net asset value is about 20% higher than that. So there's some good value for those looking at getting some exposure to Vietnam. The portfolio is concentrated. We have a high conviction approach, less than 30 holdings in the portfolio and no gearing. And the portfolio is invested across the key themes that come out of Vietnam's attractive macroeconomic story. The industrialization opportunities on the back of 30 years of foreign direct investment into Vietnam for export and the important business to business linkages that support that business. The domestic consumer story, as Vietnam's 100 million people get increasingly wealthier with more disposable income, prevents tremendous opportunities for us. And also the urbanization story, as the wealth effect increases and people want to live in better houses with access to good infrastructure and utilities, there's some opportunities through good real estate developers there. We're on the ground as a team, we're an active manager we're a nimble manager and we're able to invest across the spectrum of company size. So from the smaller companies, perhaps we can take our private equity approach even to listed companies. And then we can also invest in the larger cap companies as well. Although we're an absolute return fund and we don't benchmark ourselves formally against an index, we can demonstrate strong outperformance against a number of the indices in Vietnam. The fund has been a signatory of the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investing for over a decade. And so responsible investing and ESG is integrated into our investment process. This slide is probably familiar to many of you now, uh, and I won't dwell on the key points, particularly on the digitalization aspects. We'll hear about that later on. But don't forget, of course, that you know, Vietnam had a tremendous growth uh, journey last year when the rest of the world was pretty much in recession with its economy growing about 3%. And importantly for us is that per capita GDP. As Vietnam goes past $3,000, that's the inflection point in the consumer society. And that provides tremendous opportunities for us as an investor. And Vietnam remains very much open for trade, even though the, the borders may be closed at times to contain COVID, it's very much an open economy in terms of its trading globally with its partners. Just a little bit of update on the macro. Today is more about the micro, I won't dwell on the macro. Uh, but since our last webinar at the end of February, Vietnam has a new prime minister, Mr. Phan Minh Chin, appointed in April for a five year term. And the government's really reaffirmed its objectives to set Vietnam to become a, a more modern industrialized country, for its people to be more middle-income consumers, and also for Vietnam to be a key part of the global supply chain. In the first quarter, the economy has done uh, really well, almost 4.5% year-on-year growth. And this year, the GDP growth is forecast to be back to its kind of uh, three-decade average, about 7%. Driving that is strong growth in exports, uh, which uh, rose by 45% year on year. And within that, electronics, computers, mobile phones, and accessories are a key part of that. And Vietnam's an important player in laptops and computer manufacture. 
Uh, and it's very interesting to note, I think just today, Microsoft say they're going to come up with a new operating system. And typically that starts a new uh, cycle of demand for consumer electronics. So Vietnam could well benefit from that. And retail sales and services have also rebounded about 30% year on year uh, in April. Inflation, as with the rest of Asia, it's picking up a little bit, but it's uh, still controlled for now and it's within our expectations and the alarm bells certainly aren't going off at these levels of inflation. And the currency, the Vietnam Dong, remains stable. COVID's not going away anytime soon anywhere in the world. What was named a pandemic last year, the Singapore Prime Minister earlier this week said actually it's endemic and the world's going to have to get used to dealing and living with COVID. Vietnam clearly did a fantastic job last year in terms of very rapidly controlling and moving swiftly. Uh, but there have been some uh, recent spikes in May, the fourth wave uh, affecting Vietnam, as it is across Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, Indonesia, and as well as places like Taiwan as well. Ho Chi Minh City and Baxiang have implemented uh, social distancing. Ho Chi Minh City is coming towards the end of its first week of social distancing. And the government's continuing its strong coordinated measures to quash these cases and these outbreaks when they emerge. In Asia, unlike perhaps uh, UK, certainly in Europe perhaps, the vaccination levels are relatively low at the moment. In Vietnam, less than one and a half percent of the population are vaccinated. It's probably similar to Thailand. But the government is keen to push on this program and they've set up a $1.1 billion fund to procure more vaccine. Vietnam has been receiving some COVAX vaccine as well as directly procured vaccine. But Vietnam also wants to manufacture vaccine in Vietnam, made in Vietnam vaccine, not just for its own domestic population of 100 million people, but also so it can help replenish COVAX and supporting other countries because no one's safe until we're all safe uh, with COVID. So we'll keep an eye on this, but uh, the government seemed to be well on top and in control of uh, the recent outbreak. But no one's been complacent, neither in Vietnam nor in any other part of Southeast Asia. As we look at the equity market, Vietnam continues this dramatic arc upwards. And the market capitalization across its three exchanges, close to 260 billion US dollars. It was less than $300 million 20 years ago. So that's quite a dramatic increase. And on the graph on the right, you can see that the liquidity is also reached record levels. It's about a billion dollars a day now in stock transactions, which is three times the level it was in 2019. In fact, this week, that level's gone up to $1.3, $1.4 billion. And interesting to note also is the, is the complexion of that. Historically, maybe foreign investors accounted for about 20 to 25% of, of the volume, but today it's the foreigners are less than 10%. So we've seen a dramatic increase in participation of domestic actors, uh, younger people and other people wanting to be part of the growth in the capital markets, enabled by technology, enabled by applications and by EKYC and mobile devices, and with a low interest rate environment. So the stock market's become very active as a result of that. And these aren't people investing in uh, meme stocks, you know, like GameStop and others in in the US, these are people investing in you know, fundamentally profitable growing businesses, steel manufacturers and banks, many of which are in our portfolio. However, those levels of transaction haven't been without problem. And uh, at times the exchange infrastructure has kind of creaked a little bit. And just this week, uh, the afternoon session in Ho Chi Minh City Stock Exchange uh, was canceled because the volume of transactions was so high. So efforts are underway to upgrade the stock market infrastructure to handle increased volumes. And they'll be calling on people perhaps like FPT, our guest speaker today and other companies to, to try and help improve that infrastructure. And also Vietnam wants to move towards uh, a central depository system and move to inter intraday, intraday settlement, a T plus zero eventually. So the infrastructure should get improved over time and support even greater levels of stock market activity. So the market recovered quickly and rapidly from last year's sell-off in, in March due to COVID. And the market's really kind of looking through uh, these current outbreaks of the fourth wave uh, and buoyed by this uh, domestic uh, stock activity. Yet the market as a whole is not expensive. 
uh, the Vietnam All Share Index and the other indices around 15 times PE, which is kind of in line with kind of historical averages. And yet the underlying growth, the earning per share growth is significantly higher. So um, the, the market growth is probably about 30% EPS growth this year. And at that 14, 15 times PE, whereas actually our portfolio is on an 11 times PE and uh, on a 40% EPS growth. So really growth at a very reasonable price. And the daily liquidity on the stock market now means that the Vietnam stock market is is probably the most liquid market in ASEAN other than Thailand. So as we take a look at our portfolio, FPT, they'll be talking to us in a minute, our number one position at 10.5% of net asset value. It's been our number one position for a number of years now uh, and in our portfolio for an even longer period of time. Quafat Group uh, is Southeast Asia's largest steel maker and FPT has gone up probably more than 60% this year as has Quafat Group. And also interestingly in our portfolio, you'll see a number of banks and the banks have uh, experienced dramatic growth this year. Uh, stable net in interest margins, increased credit growth, um, modest uh, NPLs and reversals of some provisions and using their banking infrastructure and network to distribute bank assurance and other products, as well as perhaps looking at digitalization of their customers. So the banks are doing really well. They're about 30% of our portfolio. If you had a time machine and could go back to our portfolio 18 months ago, you'd see less than 10% of the portfolio in, in banks. And the team undertook a very thorough analysis of the whole banking sector and about 18, 24 months ago. And we started to allocate more into banks and those investments have paid off very well for, for the fund and for our investors. And you can also see a couple of our retail names in their mobile world and PNJ. PNJ has been in our portfolio for a very long time. In a private equity sense, it's probably a 10x um, in terms of its compound earning that is delivered to our portfolio. And a couple of our um, real estate companies, Vinhome and Kang Dien. As an interesting aside, many of these companies in our top 10 have either had foreign investors or private equity investors or strategic investors. And I think that's helped uh, with their reporting, their corporate governance, their transparency and their experience in dealing with investors. And as we'll hear in a minute from uh, Mr. Fu from FPT, many of the Vietnamese companies have very high class investor relations and take uh, their stewardship very seriously. So we're pleased with the portfolio performance and we're sticking to our themes of, of the industrialization, the urbanization and the domestic consumer underpinned by that strong uh, banking sector. And our portfolio remains uh, concentrated, top 10 positions, almost 68% of net asset value. Everyone likes a chart. I say we're not um, index uh, benchmark per se, uh, but if you do compare our performance against uh, the indices, you'll see that it's been strong. Actually in our financial year, so from 1st of July until end of May, uh, our net asset value per share has increased by about 90%. And if you were to look at even the broader market, the Vietnam index, that's probably up 62%. So there's good demonstration of alpha outperformance by finding good companies. So good stock selection, good portfolio construction and engaging and working with our portfolio companies on the ground. Well, we're delighted now to have Mr. Fu, who is at FPT, to talk a little bit about the whole digitalization aspect, aspect in Vietnam, but also FPT's role in building the foundations for future growth. After Mr. Fu has uh, spoken, we'll have Q&A and you can direct questions either to Mr. Fu or to the team generally about the portfolio and I'll moderate the Q&A. So let me just hand over now to Mr. Fu. Yes, thank you so much for your introduction. I think it was a great dynam has always been one of the most closest investor with the firm Ebony. We have been following up with each other for a long time and they are always one of the closest investors that understand the business of uh, Ebony very well. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation for the firm today. And I am very glad that I'm able to share to the investor about today about digital transformation in Vietnam. 
So a little bit introduction about myself. My name is Fu Zheng, and I am currently the investor relation manager of Epic Corporation, one of the largest technology firm in Vietnam. We have been operating in Vietnam for more than 30 years and pioneering in a lot of aspect of technology in Vietnam, including the national IT system, the internet industry, the IT outsourcing business, and also the education for uh, IT and computer science in Vietnam. And uh, this year, actually, uh, one of the key things that we find out for 2020 and 2021 is that the, this is a perfect moment for digital transformation and the technology scene here in Vietnam. And I hope that uh, throughout this uh, presentation, I can show it more clearly to the investor today. So first of all, why do we see that this is a perfect timing for the technology scene in Vietnam? Just as mentioned in the presentation of the fund, Vietnam just went through a lot of transformation for the last 30 years. We have seen 30 times growth in terms of GDP per capita between 1989 and 2019. Very similar to what happened to China, where everyone, the living standard just went through the roof and people just saw so much changes in their life in such a short amount of time. And during that time, not only household living standard in, uh, improved a lot, also the business in, in Vietnam thrived and flourished. In 2018, we have 1 trillion US dollar, more than 1 trillion US dollar in terms of revenue contributed by the business sector of Vietnam. And we have more than 600,000 enterprises having operation during that time. And around 1% of those are very large enterprise. So you see that Vietnamese enterprises and business gain not only in terms of number, but also in terms of scale. So this is a perfect example of how we have transformed our country throughout a very short amount of time. This is Ho Chi Minh City in only a few decades. It changed very clearly. So with that kind of transformation, the people here are very used to new behavior, new technology. That is why we also have very high rate of technology adoption. As you can see here, this is a number uh, of the penetration of internet in a few major provinces in Vietnam, according to M, uh, Group M. A very high penetration rate, especially in urban area in the big cities. And uh, this is thanks to the policy of Vietnam and also the geography of Vietnam, which helped to reduce the uh, infrastructure cost of internet. And also uh, the internet access fee in Vietnam is uh, among the lowest globally. That is why uh, Vietnamese people uh, enjoy very low cost to the internet. And most of them have adopted the use of smartphone very early. Around 80% of the working age population owns a smartphone now. So you can see that someone who is 30 years old now, they are the generation who first got it to uh, get in contact with the internet. They also get in contact with smartphone. And now they are very used to using new technology at the moment. So thanks to that kind of behavior, our digital economy in Vietnam is also a very large, around 14 billion US dollar in 2020. And it is expected to grow very strongly for the next few years to around 29% per annum, reaching around 52 billion US dollar in 2025, which is second highest in uh, Southeast Asia, only below Philippines. And that kind of growth actually put the business in Vietnam into perspective. As you can see that we have so many businesses now in Vietnam and also they just started to have the scale and the, the sophistication to move up on the value chain where there's so much competition from global firms here, Facebook, Google, Grab, Gojek, Shopee, but also the rising startups in Vietnam are very digital. In the past, all of these corporations in manufacturing, in banking, they may need very simple system to manage their operation like Excel only. But now they have thousands of people working maybe across the globe. They cannot do that anymore. They understand that IT uh, function is not only some kind of back office function anymore. In the past, uh, we estimate that Vietnamese firm only spend around less than 1% of re their revenue on IT, which is a very low priority uh, function in their business. But what we are hoping forward and also working with a lot of corporations, what they are working on is to achieve the level uh, just very closely to the global firm, which is around uh, more than 3% of their revenue now.
And in some major industry like uh, banking, they may even spend around seven to 8% of their revenue on IT. And that kind of spending and also the acceleration in terms of digital transformation for businesses in Vietnam, thanks to their gain in scale and uh, more competition and partly also because of COVID-19 where people uh, see the benefit of having the system in place. We will see so much potential upside for adoption of digital technology post COVID-19. So in the next few years, technology like the cloud, AI, blockchain will gain so much momentum in Vietnam. But when we work with so, uh, the industry leader here in Vietnam in multiple industries, seafood, banks, and uh, manufacturing, what we see is that in the past, they only see IT apps, you know, as I mentioned, very small function in the business. But now it's supposed to be something that drives the growth of the business, but they don't know how to do it. So that is why we have to come in and advise them on the very detailed plan, very detailed blueprint for them on how to accelerate their digital transformation. And that is why a few years ago, we worked with an expert in this ex-CIO of DuPont Global, Mr. Phuong Chum, to, to work on a very innovative digital framework for Epity Digital Kaizen, which can help our client to think about their digital transformation and what is the plan to have that in place. So our framework will help them to build not only the IT infrastructure, but also change the culture of the people and get ready and prepare for the digital transformation initiative that we will implement for them. So when we see this kind of momentum for digital transformation in Vietnam, Epity, the pioneer in this sector, and also the leader in terms of technology and IT services in Vietnam, what we are hoping to do is to provide the service to three main major uh, drivers of the economy and the society in Vietnam, including government, big enterprises, and SME. For the government sector, we have always been working with the government, with a new administration whose plan is to make Vietnam a digital country with a focus on government, economy, and society. All of those will become very digital. Everybody is working with all uh, the major government uh, authorities and uh, definitely a lot of provinces in Vietnam right now. We are heading the digital transformation journey of uh, a few uh, provinces, including Bình Định and Khánh Hoa. And we still have the pipeline of 13 other provinces to uh, work with in the future. For the big enterprises, as I mentioned, we are working with all the major industry players right now. And we are targeting around more than 200 big enterprises in Vietnam to accelerate their digital transformation journey. And in terms of SME, currently we estimate that there is around 800,000 SME in Vietnam right now. We have acquired a firm called Base.vn, which is a rising startup providing software as a service to these kind of enterprise and businesses. We hope that with this package solution from a very innovative platform based on the end, we can digitalize the SME scene here in Vietnam, which is a major factor that drives the growth of Vietnam economy. So thank you so much. That is a, the, the summary of the digital transformation here, scene here in Vietnam. I hope that I give you some general perspective on the scene and I am welcoming all the questions possible from the, the audience. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Fu. Thank you for that very uh, comprehensive overview, both of the digital landscape and also of what FPT, who are a very proud shareholder in your company. Just give people a chance to add some additional uh, questions in the q and I've, I've got a couple of, of questions. I was sponsored through university by British Telecom, which many people will know in the UK, had a lot of legacy business and has been trying to upgrade it's broadband and put fiber and new technologies. Fu, you touched on the fact that Vietnam's internet is relatively low cost, and yet it's widespread through the country, and it seems to be profitable for you as a business. Do you want to touch a little bit on, on why is that? You mentioned the geography. Why is that important? Uh, yes. So unlike most other countries, Vietnam actually have a very connected geography. We don't have a lot of islands and also the mountainous area don't have a lot of people. Most of the landscape of uh, Vietnam is very uh, flat and we are major line across the country and then uh, range out to all of the areas, which help us to reduce the uh, investment 
in terms of infrastructure because we don't have that kind of difficulty in terms of uh, geography. Thank you. Yeah, I think British Telecom also has a massive pension liability, which FPT doesn't have. But you're you're yes. clearly growing well, which is which is great. Perhaps, Fu, can you touch a little bit about human capital in Vietnam? Yes. Is that well suited to technology? And how, how does FPT find all the people you need? I think human resources are actually one of the key things that make Vietnam very competitive. Due to the few reasons, actually, Vietnamese population is very young and highly educated. And the culture focuses a lot on math and probability. That is a key thing when you look at digital technology like AI and uh, uh, blockchain. Those are the key uh, skills that uh, are required for that kind of growth. So definitely Vietnamese culture and also the population are very well fit for that. And the strong focus on education help us to grow that kind of skill set for our population very quickly. And uh, because everybody also work in education, we see that Vietnamese parents are actually very observant about the market for job. They move their kids to get a major in what kind of job that can be the most beneficial for their family very quickly. So that is why like, seven or eight years ago, it's very hard for the student to get uh, into uh, banking or finance university where they can get a job out of the college. But for the last three to four years, actually, most of the students, when they go to college, they think about IT and computer science. And that is a very great trend, both for the education branch of EPIT, but also for the overall market of engineer and uh, IT labor in Vietnam. Great, thank you, Fu. Fu, there's a question here about FPT, about who are your main competitors and what are your competitive advantages? Yes, so it depends on the market and also the kind of client that we serve. But in terms of the global IT outsourcing, we are actually facing directly with tier one Indian firms like Infosys, TCS. Our current com competitive advantage is still, first of all, we have low cost and high quality IT labor. Second, we are willing to grow with our own customer. So even the customer who have a smaller project, we are willing to work with them very early on and we are willing to commit and grow with them. That is something that big firms like Infosys and TCS may not be willing to work on smaller projects like that. And also depends on the market. For example, for Japan, we have the very good advantage in terms of language and also the culture. And in Asia Pacific, we have the location advantage. In terms of the domestic market, actually, Epity is the only firm large enough and with enough credential to work on major projects. And we are the private firm that can provide the highest quality of service in Vietnam right now. There's a question, Fu. Obviously, many people in Vietnam know FPT as an IT services uh, company. There's a question about how you move into software development. And you mentioned AI. Is that something that's featuring in your business going forward? Yes, surely. You know, Epity have invested in two things. First of all, our technology capability. We uh, partner with the Research Institute for Strategic Technology, like AI. We work with Mila Institute in Canada. They are the major institute regarding artificial intelligence. So they will help us to grow our capabilities and algorithm library for AI here in Vietnam. So we are constantly working with partners and also uh, internally find new capability in the technology. And second, we also create strategy to develop our own software solution or maybe product as you uh, mentioned. And besides the internal effort um, to create those products, you may uh, have heard about Akabot, Akachain, those are the products very successful right now. We also acquire from based on to have that kind of product offer to SME in Vietnam. Very good, thank you. And there's a question if BT has a, a large education business, you have a large domestic broadband business, and you have an overseas software development business. Are these all yes. totally standalone, or do you see um, synergies between the technology and the telecom side of, of the business? Uh, Actually, in the past, when these uh, businesses are, uh, we let them to grow on their own a lot. So there were not a lot of synergy back then. But uh, two years ago, when the new CEO came into place, 
he's a very active and ag aggressive guy. He saw that there's so much opportunity to be created when there's synergy among these businesses, which are very large right now. Uh, the largest one providing around five, more than 500 million US dollar in terms of revenue. What we are working on right now is to create the synergy by, uh, first of all, combine our effort in terms of sales to create a bundle service uh, solution to our client. Second, we will uh, try to provide an end-to-end -end from consulting to service to product solution. Last but not least, we will also create a kind of synergy and advantage uh, with our size in terms of number of people and human resources. We will train people from education, move them up into our businesses, and we even rotate them around in our businesses to create some kind of cross-knowledge and cross-experience between the businesses. Thank you, Fu. Fu, I'll let you catch your breath. We've got a couple of questions about the broader macro in Vietnam, but we'll come back to you yes. just before we finish. A question around Vietnam's foreign direct investment and trading partners around the nature and, and the source. Tan, do you want to talk to that, the top five countries in terms of foreign direct investment and trading? Yeah, the top uh, FDI investors in Vietnam accumulated uh, capital. They are also key trading partners of Vietnam. And the traditional partners are Japan and Korea. They are very famous with uh, the mega project Samsung, Toyota, uh, Honda, a very famous uh, one. Uh, and now uh, we have seen the increasing uh, FDI from China, and we have uh, seen the relocation from China to Vietnam. So uh, for the last two years, we see that the FDI increased from, from that. And for the trading uh, value, we also are seeing the, the increasing uh, value from, from China, from the US, but we also are seeing the emerging trading value from broader areas like Australia, the ASEAN, and the very traditional market, the EU. Thanks. Thanks, Tan. And as just to add to Tan there, this concept of China plus one as manufacturers to Vietnam for strategic reasons has deepened the ties uh, with many countries within perhaps North Asia, Taiwan, Korea, uh, as well as we've spoken in previous webinars about the number of free trade agreements and how Vietnam's very open in that regard. There's a, a question around MSCI. I'll just talk perhaps very briefly to that. Uh, the question is paraphrasing, Vietnam's got all the characteristics of an emerging market, yet it's still classified as a frontier market. And in fact, it's the largest constituent of the frontier market index. When will it be classified? Well, in short, we don't know, but it's taking the steps in terms of improving its stock market infrastructure liberalizing the rules and regulations to become considered as an emerging market. And most importantly, the government is very supportive and the regulator wants Vietnam to be seen as an emerging market under MSCI, but it'll still be some time. But notwithstanding that, the steps are being taken to improve both the hard infrastructure, the exchange improvements, and the soft infrastructure in terms of allowing ETFs and other mechanisms to develop and, and broadening the, the depth of the capital market. There's a question on um, back on to if you can talk to this, which is what regions in Vietnam do you see that will benefit most from digital transformation? And will this also impact the rural areas in Vietnam? Yes, definitely digital transformation will improve the, the uh, scene most in major city like Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City first, because that is where the most adoption of technology came from. But I do think that even for rural area, actually the digital transformation will take place, even though it's going to be a little bit different from the urban area, because the difference will will actually help us to be more creative in terms of how to tackle these clients. So for example, most of the rural area don't have as much access to the bank as in the, the rural area. So the way that we can do financial inclusion for these uh, clients will be a little bit different from the ones in the big cities. But definitely Vietnamese government trying to promote new kind of fintech like uh, mobile money and something like that will accelerate uh, that kind of digital transformation in the rural area in a more or less different than what you have seen in the cities. Thank you, Fu. And a question uh, for Tin, I'll let you rest again, Fu. 
which is around portfolio conviction. The question here, what would be the highest conviction positions in the Vietnam holding portfolio other than FPT, which is such a great company for steady upwards growth? And very briefly, why are those sectors our conviction? Tim, do you want to talk to that? We see that uh, banks in Vietnam on the head edge and uh, looking for a good earning this year and next year. Most of the banks that we invested in, we expect that they, they will deliver about 25 to 30% earning growth this year and continue to more than 20% next year. So we believe that buying sector could be a, a good, good sector to invest and to be a strong conviction in our portfolio like PG, like MBB, a very good bank. So we believe that could be a strong conviction besides APT. In addition, we also observe the mega chain, the commodity material for construction and other. And we see that the company working on that area like uh, Hua Phan, HBG can enjoy their growth uh, for a couple of uh, quarters. Last year, the company delivered 76% earning, earning per share growth. This year, we also expect that they can grow more than 70%. On. That's why that, uh, we still keep that. However, we, we close look on the material price to rebalance it. Another sector that we see can continue to be good, that's the real estate sector. A number of companies that the pre sales uh, apartment and, and houses that very high, given the low rate interest rate, that's making people buy more. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you, Tin. Well, we'll come to the end of our time today. So. In conclusion, I'd like to thank Mr. Fu. Clearly, the digital economy in Vietnam is set for great growth. It could reach $52 billion by 2025, and e-commerce uh, second to none in Southeast Asia, and FPT has a key part to play in that. And in terms of the Vietnam holding portfolio, we're very pleased with the performance of our companies, uh, setting records, both in terms of our, our portfolio, our share price, and the net asset value per share, as well, of course, the underlying index has also reached uh, record levels. This is the 15th year of Vietnam holding and the third year of Dynam Capital. And so there's a lot to celebrate um, in Vietnam. And we'd like to thank you all for your time, for attending the webinar. Uh, thank you once again to Fu for his time to present to us all. The presentations uh, and a recording of the webinar will be made available and distributed uh, next week. So without further ado, just to wish you uh, a very safe Friday. Uh, keep well, and we look forward to being in touch with you again very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.